put it on there. Okay. So you don't have to worry about uh, going into the sources. So. Okay, and is, do you guys still have the portable one? Mm -hmm. I don't know if she's a mover or not. Uh, yes, we do. If you, if you want one, just let me know. I'll just, okay. uh, Great, well, I'll... you know what? I'll put one out for you. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Just like a lavalier type one? Yeah, I guess that they... A little clip one? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, so doing this session, does this one always show? Yes. Okay. Oh, but then she'll be speaking on this side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. great. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much the same. So. Yeah. Oh. 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 Yeah. Oh.
Yeah, yeah. Well, they were. Well, they were. 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 They were.
Oh, great. That's good. I want a lineup. Oh, awesome. Yeah. 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 Oh, you're going to have to Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Dan. Oh, you Oh, boy. We're just going to let people get their sandwiches and we'll start soon. committee that gets to select uh, wonderful speakers for uh, the Dr. Arthur Dodek Lectureship in Medical Ethics and Professionalism. So I just want to say a few words about Dr. Dodek. So he was first appointed to St. Paul's Hospital in UBC in 1972, and he was uh, among one of the first uh, British Columbia cardiologists to be board certified and also to get the Royal College uh, Fellowship designation in cardiology. Um, he obviously was very pivotal in the growth of this uh, division at UBC and at St. Paul's um, and was at the forefront of new techniques and state-of-the-art uh, medical care. Um, he was the first uh, to insert, for those in medicine, um, the swan gans catheter at St. Paul's Hospital, and he also performed the first valvuloplasty in 1985. Um, while he was doing all of this, he had an emerging and parallel interest in medical ethics, and he published on the topic. And then he became the chair of the Ethics Committee at the College of Physicians and Surgeons of BC, and actually served as the president between 2007 and 2009. So Dr. Doda has established this lectureship in gratitude for his positive experience at St. Paul's Hospital. So we are also really grateful that he did that and we get to benefit um, having these wonderful speakers come to us for each of our inaugural grand rounds when we start our academic year. So now I'm going to turn it over and speak a little bit about um, 
Dr. Lisa Richardson, uh, who is a clinician educator at the University of Toronto. She's also a general internist like me. She's in the division of GIM there, and she practices at the University Health Network. She's an educator researcher at the Wilson Center at University of Toronto, and her academic interest lies at the uh, integration of critical and Indigenous perspectives in medical education. Um, she's a faculty co-lead in Indigenous medical education in their MD undergraduate program and is an um, associate professor in the Department of Medicine where she leads a new portfolio called Person-Centered Care Education. Um, she's the Indigenous Strategy Lead for Women's College Hospital, and she also holds the Wilson Center's Indigenous Health Education Investigator Award um, that reflects her work related to teaching cultural safety. She chairs several provincial and national committees to advance Indigenous medical education, and also was recently honored by the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Thomas Dignan Award for Indigenous Health. So I ask you to give a round of applause to welcome Dr. Lisa Richardson. Miigwech. Uh, Bonnie, thank you for the introduction. Um, just going to make sure that I clip this on. I should have set this up. I could... Actually, I'm just going to stand here. <laughs> um, thank you to the five, na five Coast Salish nations for having me on their traditional unceded territory. Uh, that's, of course, the practice of land acknowledgement is something that we have done for many, many, many years. That practice of understanding the people who are in the land or when you're walking into a new space, understanding where peoples have come from is really very important. It's not just a symbolic act, it's about understanding that we all have histories and locations. And that's a lot of what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, Anita and I, I'm, I'm so honored to be here and, and, and re reading about Dr. Arthur Dodek's work, both your work um, as a cardiologist and then and thinking about your work at the college and interest in professionalism and, and ethical practice more broadly is, is always, uh, it's always an honor to do a named lecture. And I was thinking about this idea of named lectureships and why that resonates with me as an indigenous person. And I think the reason is that for us, we, as Indigenous peoples, we pay attention to our ancestors. Not only do we think six, seven, genera seven generations ahead, but we think about the people who have walked before us and gone before us. And this idea about naming and recognizing the amazing work that is done by others who have opened doors for us and pathways, I think is very important. So thank you for creating this opportunity. Um, I've talked, I've, I'm going to briefly give you an outline. I am an educator. Um, I wanted, of course, and I, I acknowledge the territory, but also wanted to acknowledge the incredible photography that you'll see in this, in this um, presentation. Are you able to hear me, by the way? Okay. And, and um, this is by Nadia Kwandavans, who's an Anishinaabe photographer. She runs Red Works. Um, photography. She's given me permission to use these photos. I actually have paid for the rights to use them. I'm very uh, conscious of that. Um, and it's about recognizing that we communicate and, and think in different ways as well. And that art, and Leah Walker and I were talking about this earlier, art is actually a very important way in which, as an educator, I work with learners and others to think about transformative learning. Engaging in art, artistic practice or even looking at works of art reminds us that we all have specific positions and ideas and they can get you into a place of creativity and vulnerability that you can't necessarily get to in this style of a learning environment and that's what we know from the transformative education literature, that's how we're really able to push people. So I very specifically and deliberately include her work here. Um, 
I also wanted to acknowledge I work very closely with numerous collaborators across the country. I'm so fortunate to do that. Um, some of you may know them because many of them are <laughs> they're, they're well-known people in both the indigenous health world and then also in the education field. So Dr. Marcia Anderson, the Anishinaabe physician based in Winnipeg, Dr. Allison Crawford, who's uh, a non-indigenous physician who works a lot in the uh, medical humanities and, and is an ally who does work in Arctic health, and Dr. Dr. Ayala Cooper, who is also an educator, a non-Indigenous educator who's, uh, and researcher. Um, I'm going to be presenting at the end of this talk some specific ideas around structural change that came from work that I did, and that was funded by the McConnell Foundation, so being conscious of that. Um, I'm going to introduce myself, speak about several foundational frameworks, and then talk about some key concepts. There's always this tension when you're working in Indigenous health. And that is, is this relevant? I don't, you know, this isn't relevant for me. This is just about you, indig about Indigenous people. And we are now at the stage where we are saying to people, the ways in which we have understood, cared for, thought about health and healing are actually really powerful ways to think about health for all peoples, not just for Indigenous peoples. So I'm going to, these concepts around state, cultural safety, allyship, trauma-informed care, anti-racist, anti-colonial practice actually help us provide good care for all peoples. But we also need to be very specific in understanding the experiences of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples in our country. So as I speak, keep that in mind. How Will these ideas resonate and help me in the care for all of my patients? And what are the specific needs that my Indigenous clients may have that are distinct and specific and require special specific programs? Um, and then lastly, because I've been doing this work for a long time and I never want to seem like I'm like Debbie Downer, you know, the person who's giving the bad messages, I want to give you some concrete ideas to take forward around institutional and structural change. And when I look at the work that St. Paul's have, has done already, it's actually very impressive. And a lot of what you are doing here is work that I've written about in this in this document for based on the research I did for the, with the McConnell Foundation. So wanting to acknowledge that amazing work that's already happening here, and of course the amazing work that my colleagues James Andrew and, and Leah Walker are doing in the Faculty of Medicine and Health, and more broadly in Health Sciences. Um, anytime we work, we come together as Indigenous people, we acknowledge it, we introduce ourselves. That's about our connection to our history, our land base, and our ancestors. It helps us know who's ta who we're talking to. And when I do this work with learners, I, I'm very, we need to create, quote, more safe learning environments. So you need to know when you're speaking, if you are speaking about an experience of mistreatment, you need to understand where everyone else in the room is coming from. So this is a part of an educational strategy, too. I'm not going to ask you all to introduce yourself. I don't think we have time for that. Ideally, I would, quite frankly. But I am going to introduce myself. I am a mixed blood person. I'm Anishinaabe. On my mother's side, our community is called Shebanonin. It's also known as Killarney. It's actually just south of Sudbury on, in Georgian Bay. I appear to be white. My father was European, Scottish primarily. So I walk in two worlds all the time. I walk in the world as a mixed blood person. I walk in the world of being in the community and being in academic practice. That's an uncomfortable place, actually. Never quite fit in anywhere. I'm an insider, outsider, no matter where I go. What is the, I've come to understand the strength of that. And the strength of that positioning when you are in some of those liminal places is that you are always bring, you are bringing fresh perspectives. You're able to see things in a different way. You may never feel like you quite fit in. And now, now actually, in the, the reality is that in, our, in Indigenous communities, we don't worry about the, the sort of blood quantum. That's more of a colonial practice. But um, it, it's just, it's come to be something that's very important for me to understand and acknowledge my own positioning. Our community is actually one that I want to talk about for a moment because it exemplifies what's happened in Canada very well. 
Our chief actually never signed on to the Robinson-Huron Treaty, which most of the nations around the, around, uh, the Georgian Bay Area signed on to in the, in the 1800s. Um, and, and that was, uh, so, so technically we're unseated, an unseated community. But then there was actually a, a, a visitor, a European visitor, who came along and, and his, he, he was a settler and he was there with his wife who actually recognized that our community was, it was located in a really beautiful place. And Shevadoning is an Anishinaabe and Moyen uh, word for canoe passage. So it had this very beautiful, it has a very beautiful calm area where the boats could pass. And so she liked it very much and decided, they decide, the government of Canada then decided to um, put a post office there, put a post box. And so it became known as Killarney. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that we then lost our, we lost our recognition as an indigenous community. So we fell off to what's called the list of all of the bands. And our people then had to register with all of these other communities where our cousins and, and other people belonged, but couldn't be on our own specific territory. What's happened now is that we have, so that's a story of assimilation, right? That's a very powerful story about how one can assimilate effectively. And in fact, many people in our community then did something called enfranchisement, which is our uh, lost their indigenous status by, um, you know, signing over their indigeneity essentially to the Indian agent and often getting paid for that. Okay, so two different approaches and very powerful assimilatory processes. What's happening now, which is why I tell the story, is that our youth, the youth in our community, are doing incredible work to actually have our nation and community recognized again as Shevanoning rather than Killarney. We will never have that specific land base because it's a municipality now, and in fact there are many cottagers there. It's very complicated. But at least we do want to be able to, rec to be recognized in, as our specific community. And that work is being done by incredible young people who are well-educated, articulate, advocating. So many of the piece, many actually um, items from our community are found, that were found on archaeologic digs are now housed at the Royal Ontario Museum and the University of Minnesota Museum. The young people that I'm talking about are actually, are, and some are my cousins, are working to have that, it's called deaccession, to have those pieces brought back to our community. That is a story of youth, that is a story of education, that is a story of resurgence. I don't use the word revitalization. Our communities, our peoples, our culture did not die. But we are, ha we are now finding our voices again as indigenous peoples. So that is why I, I, locate, I introduce myself in that long way, not because I want, I actually don't like talking about myself. I get really embarrassed around the introductions and bios and all of that. But I want you to understand specific policies and practices through story and narratives. I think it's very helpful. The major frameworks that frame any, any kind of thinking around reconciliation, of course, are the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and you can see them here. I'm not going to read them all out for you, but, essentially, but primarily the right to be self-determining. And secondly, and, and I, I also like to remind people about the equal right to the enjoyest of the highest, highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, and we're, we're not quite there yet. That's why we're still doing all of this work. But the second major overarching framework is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I know that you're this particular hospital, and at UBC I know there's been a lot of talk around reconciliation, so I'm not going to go through the health-related calls to action. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with them. But the principles, thinking about speaking and thinking ethically, the principles of reconciliation are that there be, it be action-based, so that the thinking leads to action, that we're actually seeing changes in outcome, that this work is not only done by Indigenous peoples. It's a responsibility for everyone to engage in reconciliation work. 
and that there be a healing process through this work, and that there be truth sharing. And this is going to lead me to my next slide, which can be shocking to people. For those of you who know my colleague, Dr. Marcia Anderson, she does hit hard with her messages. Having conversations around reconciliation is uncomfortable. It's I'm not just talking about reconciliation, talking about equity more broadly, talking about some people maybe having an unfair advantage just based on their, the luck of where they were born and who they were born to. And we need to become comfortable with having uncomfortable conversations. They are, not, they are distinct and different from unsafe ones, which you see on the left side of the screen there which are still ongoing. In fact, I had a, actually a really quite an intense morning. I'm newly on Twitter, okay? I just, I decided finally I'm gonna enter this Twitter sphere. Everyone had been telling me, you gotta share your messages, you gotta get out there. And one of the things I saw this morning on Twitter was a notice about a 14-year-old girl. And I was struck by her because my daughter is 17, but she, very, she looked very a lot, a lot like this young girl. And this is a 14-year-old girl from a community near mine in Sudbury who had gone missing. This is our reality still. Our girls are more likely to be, get into sex trafficking, are more likely to be, experience violence, are more likely to be murdered. That is unsafe. And so I think our commitment as human beings needs to be, how do we come together, have these uncomfortable conversations in order to recognize that we need to make conditions safer for all peoples and for Indigenous peoples when I think about these stories. And I'm sorry if for the Indigenous people in the room that story that I just shared was a difficult one. It's it's something that I'm still processing, obviously, with you as I speak, and I'm hoping um, that she will be located. But I would love to think that, oh, she's 14, she had a fight with her parents and has gone to sleep with friends, when in fact I know what the statistics are, and I know that that's likely. That would be the best case scenario, but it may not be what's happened to her. Cultural safety, I'm sure you're familiar with it. I'm gonna do a, just a very brief overview. Uh, there are many papers about cultural safety. It was developed initially by a Maori nurse educator, Dr. Ramsden, um, recognizing that her people in New Zealand were not experiencing the same level of care, the same kind of outcomes. Um, we adopted it very, uh, very um, enthusiastically in Canada. Our Indigenous Physicians Association of Canada worked with the uh, Medical uh, Association of, of Medical uh, AFMC to actually create competencies related to cultural safety. And this is one of those things where I say specifically thinking about some of these concepts for, helps us provide good care for all peoples. Because cultural safety exhorts the practitioner to think about the patient not just as a number, a diagnosis, but to understand the specific socio-historical, uh, economic, uh, spiritual background that they have. For Indigenous peoples, the layer is the, the extra layer is understanding colonial history, what, their, what the experiences of Indigenous peoples have been in the healthcare system, and how that may play out in, as when they cross the threshold into a healthcare institution. A lot of the work that I'm doing right now at Women's College Hospital is actually just getting people to feel comfortable to walk in to the institution, to cross the threshold, because the, it can be such a traumatic experience for, for our peoples, but not just for Indigenous peoples, for many of the peoples, I think many of the people whom you serve here, you, you look after here at St. Paul's as well. So cultural safety is, a, is different. Um, I am an educator, so you're gonna forgive me a little bit when I use some of the language about competence, et cetera, but it evolved from the concept of competence, cultural competence, because competence really is a, can, can lead to, it, it's, a, it's about the skills of the practitioner or the organization where uh, that they have the competency and the ability to understand work across cultures and provide uh, high-level high care for peoples of backgrounds that are different from their own. 
Cultural safety actually shifts, the, shifts that dynamic and asks the practitioner to think about the experience of their patients and about power. It's really so much of it is about power. It's about my, my friend who's a, a good friend who's a researcher, Suzanne Stewart, said, well, really cultural safety, Lisa, is just about being respectful. But it is much more complex than that because, unfortunately, we're not even experiencing respectful relationships. I had to testify for, before the House of Commons Standing Committee on Health in June. And I was, test I was a witness there to speak about the experiences, the ongoing experiences of forced sterilization that Indigenous women are having in the healthcare system. And I think this is one of those stories that we really need to question when we're thinking about ethical and professional practice. How is it that in December, as, as, as recently as December 2018, a woman went into the hospital to deliver a baby and had a tubal ligation without giving free prior and informed consent? So these, and this is a huge class action lawsuit. They have at least 100 women, and what the, the lawyers who have, are doing this work have said that they are anticipating when it's opened up nationally, there will be thousands. Interestingly, in thinking about your, your previous work, Dr. Dodek, this, these complaints never, these actions actually never even made it to the college. There were no specific complaints. I was there right before the Royal, uh, the uh, RCMP commissioner was questioned, which made me very nervous because, boy, did they, like, <laughs> attack her. She knew nothing about it, and she said, well, we couldn't do anything because we didn't know. And why don't people know? Because our people are scared to report because we're already experiencing a second class of care, first people's second class treatment, the report by Dr. Janet Smiley, and so to then go out and actually report this marginalizes you further. So it's, uh, this is more than respectful engagement, right? This is specific activities that are actually would qualify as assault on the part of, I mean, I'm just mortified to think that people in our own profession are doing that. And it's not, a, it's not, it's like the, when we look at the literature around violence against women, it's not the he said, she said, it's the he said, she said, she said, she said, she said, she said, right? It's a similar story where we're having more and more people who are coming forward with these complaints. Um, as I've said, it's all about understanding power, cultural safety, um, and uh, recognizes that we need to locate ourselves, our own perspectives, our own biases, and how those may play out in the care that we give. That is the hard part of this work. I'm looking at Leah because I know that you work so hard on getting people to think that is reflexivity. It's different than just understanding where you've come from. It's understanding what are your biases, we have everyone in Toronto now do the implicit bias testing before we recruit anyone. What are our biases and how are they playing out in the care that I give and what can I do to try to mitigate those biases? Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about this concept of allyship. It's pretty big right now, I <laughs> think this. There, there's a lot of talk about it. We learned about it, I think I, I'd like to credit all the work that's been done in LGBTQ health U.S. health um, around the ally campaigns, and now we're really taking it up in the in Indigenous communities and acknowledging Dr. Ayala Cooper because she and I do a lot of teaching and created this slide together around what it means to be an ally. Um, so an ally is someone who speaks up and 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 helps when asked or when they see something bad happening, helps to disrupt that. So that the person who's experiencing the discrimination does not always have to be the one who's speaking up. Why is it that important? There's a huge literature around the minority tax. And Anita and I were talking about that earlier. Having to always be the one who's speaking up, doing the work, is extremely exhausting, actually. And I was saying that, I was just saying to James and Leah that for me, the fact that I just got this promotion was I didn't really care at all about my promotion, quite frankly. 
But it was very, very important to show that I was able to beat that minority tax because actually what the literature shows is that people from the structurally marginalized groups don't get promoted at the same rate. And why is that? Because we're sitting on all these committees, we're asked to advise about policies, we're asked to go and do this teaching, and often that work is not recognized in these traditional academic environments. So that's what, for me, the idea of the promotion, the fact that this work that I'm doing was actually recognized in a meaningful way was a very symbolic moment. Um, Ashley Newslip writes very beautifully also about what it means to be an ally. But I wanted to invoke some thinking that we're now doing, those of us who do this work and are looking to allies. And that is that we need our allies and I don't know if this would, I can't, I speak for my own positioning as Nishnabekwe, Indigenous woman. Our allies need to help us do this intense emotional work of dismantling these structures that are so difficult for us. Because always being the one who's speaking up, speaking out, questioning, really has an emotional impact. And I say that we want to also focus on creating strong, healthy, resilient communities. We want those stories of strength to be ones that we focus on, rather than always having to do that difficult work. To say, well, we had a policy around paying our elders, and it's actually written and it's, it's embedded in the Faculty of Medicine, and now I'm going to pay my elder and I'm going through all of this paperwork and it turns out I'm not able to pay him or her or them, and you know they're not getting paid for five or six months. So rather than always being the one who's doing that, we look to our allies, I think, to support us in that. Trauma-informed care is another really powerful concept that resonates deeply with people, I find. The most explicit way to illustrate it is for someone who's experienced any kind of physical violence when they come into a hospital setting or healthcare setting, what is that like? Someone actually may come up to you, place their hands on you without introducing themselves. You may be surrounded by people and have a gown on that's barely covering you. If you've experienced any kind of violence in your history, you can imagine what that may be like. So that's like the clearest, so if someone's coming to you know, examine your neck, and so you've, you know, in the past had some sort of experience of violence there, you, you, need, to, you need to be telling the, uh, your patient what you're doing. I am so strong with, so dogmatic with my residents and learners. Introduce yourselves. I actually go, always will go around the room. Who's in the room? And then always explicit, I'd like to examine your abdomen now. Is that okay? Or I'm going to listen to your chest now. Like Those are just simple, small examples of trauma-informed practice. But we need to think about what it means to be a trauma-informed organization too. What are ways in which we can practice in a way that makes us a safe place for all people? And these are some of the hallmarks of being a trauma-informed organization and, and, and provider. And I think this is probably something that resonates strongly with, the, with you practicing here. I suspect that many of your clients, particularly many people who have um, opioid use disorders and other dependencies, have strong histories of trauma. So how do we as an organization incorporate this? into our practice. And these are some of the core principles around a trauma-informed organization, that it's collaborative, compassionate, that the client has choice and control, trust, safety, etc. Now, trauma-informed care is, becomes, has another whole layer when you are from a community that's experienced significant violence, marginalization, colonization. We didn't learn this in, we, we learned this in the indigenous community from our, Jew, from our colleagues and academics in the Jewish community who actually spoke about the concept of historic trauma based on, based on the Holocaust and understanding what that means 
to not just the person who's experienced immediately the trauma, but the generations that come after them. And Maria Yellowhorse Braveheart is an amazing Lakota psychologist who actually specifically wrote about what this means for Indigenous peoples. She talks about this idea of collective suffering, memory, and trauma, and how it specifically is related to uh, the experiences of, of colonial conquest, assimilation, etc. And historic trauma is not just that emotional experience. Our elders, some of the elders with whom I work, have described it as a soul wound. Like the spirit has, our spirits have been downtrodden, and how can we look to re-strengthen our spirit? And the idea that trauma also can be physically embodied. We have a concept as Anishinaabe around, and, and it's across many Indigenous peoples, of blood memory. That idea that you may live and experience, and, and you know, this stuff, people, if you're thinking in your molecular scientific hat here, you're going to say, well, this woman is crazy. But it's about that idea that one can internalize trauma that maybe you have not experienced, but that your ancestors have. Lastly, the foundation for any of this work is around anti-racist practice. Chelsea Bond is, a, is an Australian Aboriginal educator. She surveyed all of these educators in, in Australia, and there was a huge resistance to speaking about race and racism in curriculum. And she writes, I just think she puts this so beautifully, how might we get to a point which recognizes that to teach about race is not racist, but rather that pretending that race doesn't really structure health outcomes is. This is why these are difficult and uncomfortable conversations, because we need to speak about issues like race. This is why I often, and all, almost always, I didn't look, I, I may have alluded to it in this, in this talk, I speak about what it means to be white appearing white passing, to be able to walk through this world as a Nishabe Kwe, but looking like a white person. I don't have to disclose. My sister, for example, is, uh, has an advanced cancer. She has spoken about how she, and she does not visibly appear to be Indigenous either. She speaks about how she's very careful about when and whom, to whom she would disclose that she is a Nishabe Kwe. She has that privilege. So we need to start thinking about race, racism, and the effects of colonization. And those are the tough conversations. Um, I'm not going to go into the whole construction of race. I mean, I, I, I did um, graduate work in, in critical theory. And so, uh, you know, there's so much that's been written about this, but thinking about how the idea, how race came to be constructed in the context of history and this idea of being able to expand and go on expeditions and take over places because, oh, well, there was a different race of people there that were of a lesser value than, a, a, than, your, than uh, you know, the white race. So, and these, uh, Shireen Razak, um, I'm not sure if any of you know her. She was actually, we were so lucky to have her at, at OISE in Toronto, and now she's taken a, she's, a couple of years ago, she's take, taken a chair at, uh, in California. Um, she, she has written so much about racism, and particularly the, experience, uh, the construction of indigeneity. And she very clearly says that we always construct the indigenous Indian person as sick and dying, in order to help to, con to continue with that um, paternalistic approach. That's why I spoke about stories of strength. We are moving all of us who do this work to understanding a strengths-based approach because if we're constantly constructed as being not able to do this work, sick, um, you know, disease-based, our bodies are not well, then it, it allows us to continue to have that hierarchy. 
So we need to start to dismantle that, and that's an anti-racist, anti-colonial framework. And Josephine Atoa, I was so lucky and privileged to be able to work with her on a project. She and Elizabeth McGibbon have written an amazing book about anti-racist healthcare practice, and they talk about these three processes that need to happen when you're teaching. Seeing the past from stereotype to oppression, understanding and connecting how those paths and those stereotypes play out in policy and become embedded in our organizations, and then actually acting. You'll notice that action piece is always in there. So um, Lawrence Kiermaier wrote, who's done, uh, a transcultural psychiatrist, has done so much incredible work around thinking around about cultural competence, um, wrote this back in 2003. No matter how open and unbiased we are, we try to be as practitioners, they work, they, we, work against a backdrop of structural violence, racism, and marginalization. So I do all of this work at the education level. I love working with Indigenous and non-Indigenous learners. It's um, been such a joy for me. But I've started to, in, as my career has progressed, I've started to do much more work on the institutional and structural level. And I realize it's because of this statement that Florence articulates here. We can continue to work on the reflexivity piece, understanding who we are, practicing in a respectful, thoughtful, compassionate way, understanding the backgrounds of our patients, understanding colonial history, et cetera. But we need to also change structures in our institutions. So that's going to be the final. I, I said that I wanted to leave you with some positive sort of pragmatic ideas. And I'm going to move into that component now. This is based on a report that I, that I did with an amazing steering committee um, that was formed through Healthcare Can. And we had Indigenous and non-Indigenous leaders who were advising us. Um, and I worked with uh, Tracy Murphy, uh, a research assistant, and we interviewed leaders in Indigenous health and, and community members, practitioners in Indigenous health across the country, because people were struggling with how do we actually implement the TRC calls to action. Like, we're keen, we want to do, we want to do this work. We have an open heart and open mind, and we want to move forward, but we just don't know what to do. So we decided let's work and find out what people are, people are doing, the best practices, and how we can do this work ourselves. So we've called this wise practice, and I'm going to explain why it's called wise practices. Promising practices is another, another, piece, another word that you're going to hear often. Wise practices are different from best practices. Okay, we're in medicine, we're used to evidence-based medicine, everything is best practice, best practice, best practice. Well, the problem is that best practice may, had the best practice has not necessarily worked work, work for us in our specific communities as Indigenous peoples. And I think this is another one of those examples that you'll see is relevant not just in thinking about Indigenous people, but thinking about other groups that may not have been, and that may have been structurally marginalized. So how can we actually recognize that what works in one environment, one, even one hospital culture, may not work in another one. So the idea of a wise practices approach, which was first articulated in an indigenous context by a woman named Cynthia Wesley Squamot and Brian Callew, is about actually recognizing that we can create, we can look at best practices, look at evidence from that biomedical or Western lens, and also look at what our communities or our healers have been doing for hundreds of years and see how we can specifically apply them in a, in a, in a particular community, hospital, healthcare setting. Um, so that's why we chose the language best practice, as, wise practice as opposed to best practice. And the other piece I like to articulate around the best practice is that actually what is called best, that, requ that requires the sort of academic machinery that we may not be able to, that our communities who are doing small scale studies in their own communities may not actually be able to replicate. But at the same time, they know what's working and they won't know what's not. So how can we really think differently about this? 
Um, so wise practice is idiosyncratic, contextual, textured, and probably inconsistent. You can probably tell that I uh, do a lot of work as a qualitative researcher. For those of you who do qualitative research, this is probably resonating more. But I do want to say data, and data takes many forms. Stories are data, as well as numbers being data. I am not in any way suggesting that we're not collecting data. In fact, I've supported an amazing Indigenous student, epidemiology student, who's, cre who's looking at how, what does indigenous epidemiology actually look like. But we need to be able to recognize that there are these other ways of knowing too. So number one, policy and system change. Supporting local First Nations, Inuit, and Métis leaders and their national organizations as they negotiate, develop, implement, and evaluate health transformation. Well, guess what? It turns out that your organization has done that actually with the partnership with First Nations Health Authority. So it was pretty exciting for me to be reading about the, your organization and the work that's happening. And I'm sure it's not perfect. There's what is written about and what's actually happening on the ground level. But it's very inspiring to see that a lot of the stuff here that we found is what has been sort of recommended as, some, as wise practices are things that are already happening here. What does this mean? This means that we have to listen to what our own leaders and communities are telling us before going out and advocating for a system level policy change. Number two, there are 10 of them. Oh, sorry. Um, community partnerships. Sounds like you guys are doing that as well. A lot of people have difficulty with this. Who are our key stakeholders? They don't know. They're a hospital in a you know, large urban center or small center. They don't know who to reach out to. It's just asking, looking around. If you don't know who to reach out to, ask, your, you know, ask the local, the, most, the uh, First Nation band that happens to be close by. You guys are lucky here. You have some nations who are really you're, uh, you know, very close by there. You know who to reach out to. You've got good Indigenous health um, uh, service provider organization, so it's quite clear. But these are some ideas around who one might reach out to. I also learned today that Indigenous health equity is a part of your strat plan at, Saint, at Providence, which is significant. Actually, the literature around organizational change shows that when you embed equity in the strat plan, it does lead to change. Why? Anyone who is a leader here knows having something in the strat plan is something that the leaders have to deliver on. And so when you have to deliver on that, you provide resources to support that. You build structures to support that. So I'm a big believer in getting things in a strat plan. And actually, in all of the organizations that I'm working on, this is one of the pieces I push for, which is why I felt so strongly about getting Indigenous health education at the, into the um, uh, accreditation standards at the Royal College. And now at the Faculty of Medicine at University of Toronto, we have Indigenous Health. And similarly, the hospital where I'm doing a lot of my strategic work, Women's College Hospital, we have embedded this in the strat plan. So really important component. Um, indigenous peoples need to be represented across the organization, not just in the navigator role, not just in clinics serving Indigenous peoples. We need to start, uh, for the Indigenous peoples in the room, I speak to you, we need to see ourselves in all of the roles. We need to see ourselves on the board of directors. We need to imagine and aim to be deans of faculties of medicine, you know, research chairs, et cetera. This is our work as Indigenous peoples. The work of our allies is to say we value recognize and understand the contributions that you bring to our organization, not just for our Indigenous clients and students, but to the whole organization. And we are committed to supporting you, mentoring you, and having you get into these roles. And the other piece that it means as an ally is when there's someone who you feel is you know, an Indigenous candidate who uh, you, you, let's say you're in an, a research position and you feel like they're ready, and this is just good mentorship, you sponsor them and perhaps even step aside so that they can step into that role. Those are, that's why these are uncomfortable conversations. This does not mean 
that those of us who get into positions of leadership have done so just because we're an, uh, you know, I'm an indigenous woman. I, I joke about how it's like, oh yeah, the privilege of being an indigenous woman. I just, I think I just need to report, point to the MMIW. So it means recognizing in your institutions that there are different forms, strengths, forms of knowledge, ways of being that will add to your organization. And the McKinsey, like, there have been so much literature around how diversity strengthens an organization, increased academic productivity, increased grant dollars, increased performance, et cetera. I'm not here to do that work, to, to share that with you, but I'm sure you're familiar with it. So we need to be clear that we are actually adding to an organization. This does not mean that we're excluding others. We're doing this in an inclusive way. And I think that's really important too. Um, also, the leadership, we not need people, we need to have meaningful involvement with indigenous organizations. I did a review of the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and one of the things we noticed is they had this incredible reference group, and this is in the public record by the way, I'm not disclosing anything that was bad. Um, they have this incredible reference group, but it was not working. Why wasn't it working? It was advisory. So the reference group, which was composed of all these elders, community members, would speak up and speak up and speak up, and they felt like their language, their ideas were not being heard. So how do we create structures so that there is true, meaningful accountability? Um, we need to promote, promote oops, sorry, I'm just... Um, Again, we need to have people across the organization, including procurement. That's an interesting piece because I'm not a hospital leader. I'm, a, I do, I'm not thinking about this, but who are we sourcing our food from? Where are we getting to, how, let's think about how we can involve indigenous orgs in all aspects of the work that we do. Anti-racist practice. It's, it's you know, clear, I know that in BC you were actually mandated or supposed to do the Sanyas online learning module. I know that not all docs are doing it, but um, I believe and we believe the leaders who we interviewed believe that that should be uh, something that's reported and, and that organizations are accountable to. Everyone needs to feel that they can be in the organization and thrive there. There needs to be a commitment to recognizing and valuing indigeneity and supporting learners through outreach programs, et cetera. Here's the stuff where you guys are doing really well. I know that there are indigenous navigators in BC. I gather that's funded through the First Nations Health Authority. Access to traditional foods, if that's what your, what your clients want. You don't decide as an organization what this looks like. You need to speak to your communities and find out what they feel would be meaningful and important. Um, and then lastly, data. I'm gonna come back to data. So data is really important, but data is a really, really complicated issue for people who have had their data misused. And that includes indigenous peoples. So we talk a lot about this idea called of data stewardship or data sovereignty, having control, access to any data about us. Nothing about us without us. So I believe strongly in data. I think we're not going to be able to show our communities or our leadership teams that we're making any difference without having meaningful data. But you also need to have structures to make sure that that data is not being accessed by anyone to produce 10,000 papers and get their you know, promotion to their professorship without actually meaningfully giving back to the community. So data, important, but done in a good way, as we would say. And lastly, it's like I, I, I've been told recently as an, a general internist, well, because I do this work thinking about the patient's background and history and identity and their whole living situation, social determinants of health, I've been told, well, I'm not a social worker as a physician. This is not relevant to me. And my response is, well, why do I keep someone admitted to hospital for four days to make sure their diabetes is perfectly managed and I have them on the ideal dosing of their multiple daily injections of insulin if I'm going to discharge them 
and they can't afford the insulin. Or if I'm going to treat their osteomyelitis, which is a complication of their foot infection, and I'm going to discharge them to a, and they actually don't have any place to go and offload the, the foot, which is what the orthopedic surgeon has recommended. So I do believe that we need to actually be thinking more broadly about the care of our patients than just the diagnosis. I see that in my own practice, and I do, I think, I'd like to think it helps. And similarly, as practitioners, we have the voice and the power to be able to advocate around thinking more broadly about social determinants. And I know that's also work that you're doing incredibly well here, actually leading here around harm reduction, et cetera, evidence-based interventions that are known to actually have an effect. So I'm going to leave a, a time for a few questions, I guess and just end on this famous quote by Marlene Brandt Castellano, who's an incredible Indigenous scholar. Really, we talk about all of this, lead us leading, where, where, do we, where do we go with it? Coming back always to this idea of nothing about us without us, and that self-determination is critical. We are at a place now where we are doing talks like this, speaking up, speaking out, holding leadership roles. Our communities are, look, are advocating and having opportunities to speak up and speak out. And we need to make sure that we are creating those spaces within our institutions for people. To me, I struggled with this idea around ethics, Dr. Dodek. I was like, okay, what, what I'm going to, am I, am I really, is what I'm doing really about ethics? And then I realized all of these ideas that I'm speaking about to me constitute the heart of ethical practice for us as healthcare practitioners. So that's it. We started a little bit later because everyone has to get their sandwich. So I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. I'd love to thank uh, Dr. Richardson for a very inspiring and eye-opening talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? And if you could use your mic, that would be terrific. Please, Jessa. Thank you so much. Um, I wrote down a whole page of things that I'm going to look up later, so I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm one of the geriatricians here in Jocelyn. And I wanted to, your thoughts on the white coat, because I've been thinking a lot about the white coat sort of as a symbol. Um, that has pros and cons. It's something I started to do as a young female doctor to get credibility, but I'm thinking more now about my patients that are vulnerable, many of whom, you know, old, frail, cognitively impaired, substance use, Indigenous patients, and how the symbols when we walk into the room can impact that first impression and anything in general that you feel at the bedside we can do, you know, to help our patients feel more comfortable regardless of their background. And, and I guess you're feeling about the white coat. Yeah, it's funny because, as I said, I'm newly on Twitter and I made a posting about the white coat and not make, when you put on the white coat, don't, don't lose your identity. And I think that's, I, I want to come back to that because, first of all, I love that point about what do we have to do as practitioners who may be feeling like we're having, we haven't been considered credible. You know, you're still considered a nurse or you must, you might be the, you know, are you the cleaning person? Like these are the, some of the stories that we hear. So what do we have to do to be considered legitimate? And that the white coat helps with that, but does it alienate our patients? I haven't heard that actually from um, my indi from indigenous patients and clients whom I've interviewed, both in either in my own practice or for my re for the research work. What it, what matters? And and Leah, who does a ton of engagement, may have thoughts about this. What really matters is the relationship, relationality is key. So building, how do you communicate? Introducing yourself. I'm doing a keynote for ICRE next in a couple, couple of weeks, and it's all about listening. We actually don't listen very well as practitioners. We interrupt people a lot. So listening, hearing what people are telling us, um, and the idea that you don't, you may get it wrong, 
you may actually, your, your patient, after you have, you know, if you've established some kind of a connection with them, or you may hear that, that, that the white code is not right, and I realize for cognitively impaired patients, they may not say that, but the white code's just really a little bit of a barrier. But once you have, if you create a relationship of trust and dialogue, then you can have those blunders because you can address them in the moment and you can actually work, move on from them. And I've done a lot of interviews with all patients for my other portfolio in person-centered care education, and what they are telling us is really be genuine and authentic and listen. So I think when you think about that, the accoutrements become less important, but like, of course you want to be you want to introduce yourself. Imagine someone just came into your room and started questioning you without like about the most intimate details about your life, your physical health, your mental, emotional health, without introducing themselves. And we do that all the time. So I don't know if that's helpful. I think it's sort of taking it to a higher higher level. I know we're past our time, so I'm gonna close the the session, and if you have questions for Dr. Richardson, I'm sure she's happy to entertain them. Um, she will be meeting with the residents after this, and so I think it'll be a great opportunity for you to have one-on-one -on -one time with her. So I'd like you to give a, a generous round of applause. For and Dr. Dodek, we're going to have a photo with you, so don't leave. I know, right? Yeah. Yeah, are you coming? Yeah. Okay, good. I know, I don't know. I told them why. Yeah. I think what they were trying to... Hey. Thank you. Thank you.
Kushiabe for a white horse. We have a naming ceremony for it. Um, and it's got a number of stops along the way. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I
your call will be disconnected.